Oops. Here we go. Yeah, uh, I'm Richard Keene from Colorado. Uh, as uh, Norman said, I have a planet named after me and my wife, and I actually lived on a different planet at one time called Boulder, Colorado, where I taught at the university. However, 30 years ago, I moved up the Cold Creek Canyon at 9,000 feet, or 700 millibars, for those who prefer to think of it that way. And I've been a co-op observer ever since, something I'm quite proud of. And probably on the Anthony scale, my station is a two because of the horizon considerations. There are no level horizons in this part of Colorado. But outside of that, pretty good station. Uh, Roy Spencer would probably call me a weather weenie. I'm one of that class of people, and there's quite a few of you guys here. And I got interested in weather, Hurricane Hazel and Carol, 1954. And Hurricane Carol was swimming in the ocean in the streets of Wildwood, New Jersey. One of my fondest childhood memories. Okay, so I'm going to talk about how do we measure global warming? Well, first of all, what are we trying to measure? Well, global warming, true anthropogenic global warming, the theory based on 100 additional parts or 120 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, radiative transfer and all that, without any feedbacks which become inventions and judgments of the, the user, 0.2 degrees centigrade. That would be the signal that I'd be looking for is there a 0.2 degree centigrade warming attributable to CO2 over the past century? Anything else is speculation. So for example, uh, can we measure 0.2 degrees Celsius changes? Well, if you're looking for degrees change, you got to use a thermometer or something that measures temperature remotely or in situ. AGW is not measured by advancing glaciers, retreating glaciers, hurricanes, guano islands in the Pacific that are supposedly rising sea level, but the islands are sinking, federal grants, frogs, you know, getting sprouting extra legs, or even the president telling us it's happening. None of those are direct measures of global warming. They're influenced by other factors, secondary effects, and may even be totally unrelated to global warming. Now, the first one I have up there is polar bear parts. I won't get too explicit about what part is relevant here, but there was a paper a couple years ago attributing decreased virility in polar bears to the pop a population decrease, which that part is not happening. But anyway, they said there was decreased virility in polar bears due to global warming. And they actually measured the, the relevant mechanisms to determine that this was going on. And so that raises a lot of questions about data, some of which I'm going to answer in terms of weather data. Namely, uh, what is being measured? How is it being measured? How accurate are the measurements? Who is measuring it and why? <laughs> oh, into the mic. Okay, thanks. So anyway, actual published paper got past peer review. What can you say? So limitations of weather station readings. Well, one is thermometer accuracy, sighting and exposure, and Anthony has gone to that in great detail. Adjustments and homogenization. And then what I think is the big one is simple, poor coverage of the globe, which if you're going to get a global temperature, you need coverage. So thermometer accuracy, while they're calibrated to one degree, they read the one degree. A gust of wind, whoops, like that. <coughs> can raise the temperature up or down a degree or two. So basically, your lint, there's a plus or minus one degree Fahrenheit or even greater simple innate error in the thing you're measuring. Also, then you have the screens, again, stuff Anthony has talked about. And he might get a picture, a kick out of this black screen. But fortunately, that one has been decommissioned. OK. And then these you've seen, the siding, parking lots, things like that. That's a big problem. OK, then you have these observations. They go to National Climate Data Center and Jim Hansen and IPCC and all these fellows. And then what do they do with it? Well, they adjust it and homogenize it. I think Sherlock Holmes had something to say about this. There you go. It is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theory to suit facts. That would be confirmation bias. 
So some examples of these adjustments and what they have done over the years. Here are two reconstructions of global temperatures based on surface data, one from 40 years ago, or one from a couple years ago. 40 years ago, the Dust Bowl decade, the 1930s, was a big event. And there was a sharp cooling into the 1960s. And the 60s were cool, for those of us who remember it. OK, the revised version has pretty well done away with the Dust Bowl. It has suppressed the heat, brought up the, the cool, and from a half a degree Celsius cooling, it's now less than a tenth of a degree. Same original data, just different processing. And how do they rewrite it? Well, here's actually NCDC, I'll give them credit. They do publish what their adjustments are, and there's the net adjustments at the top that they put to the data. Notice the net adjustments over the past 50 years is almost identical to the quote, observe global warming that they determined from it. So in other words, the raw data has nothing. It's flatlined. The global warming signal is completely inserted. Here's another way to sort of deny what has gone on in the past and sort of exaggerate what's happened in the future is simple truncated, you know, skip the past. So this is a study I did for the Park Service about the climate of Alaska. And there's the full 100 years of record, actual station data, no adjustments, or, well, confess, you know, a few little adjustments for missing data, things like that, but pretty good straight data. And you can see up and down and up and down, and essentially a flat line signal in Alaska, a state that's supposed to be warming. Well, if you want to find warming and you can't adjust that peak of the 1930s, forget about it. <laughs> this one's for Barry, okay? <laughs> from Brooklyn. Okay, so just forget about it and go back to 1950 and no further, or 1970. And how many times have you seen somebody say, oh, since 1970, this has done that, or since 1950, or the past 30, 40, 50 years. Yeah, there's been a warming trend for a lot of reasons in that period, so you skip the inconvenient warmings of the past to make this one look special, or even, you know, the only one that's ever happened. So, According to the Dust Bowl deniers, this, the Dust Bowl, which in Colorado was a big event, never happened. You know, it's blipped from the record. Okay, poor coverage of the globe. So where are these weather stations? Well, there's surface weather stations on the ground of the Earth. Well, ground, okay, that's 30% of the surface of the Earth, and not all of it is populated. And this is important because climate change is not, you know, 0.1 degrees per century or decade or whatever, you know, steady, uniform, you know. The biggest climate changes are regional and most likely nothing to do with CO2, but everything to do with PDO, AMO, El Nino, all these kind of things, causing ridges here, troughs there, jet streams, steering winds, all that kind of good stuff. And this map shows the past 70 years of North America up in the Yukon, it's warm two or three degrees. Down in Georgia, it's cooled a couple degrees. And then you take an average of all that, and you might get two-tenths of a degree average change. So the biggest changes are these regional changes on the scale of Rossby waves. And Rossby waves are the big waves in the jet stream. Uh, the current name for a Rossby wave would be a polar vortex or something like that. But they've been around for a while, ever since the Earth was rotating. Okay, so let's look at Alaska. Alaska is kind of a poster child for climate change. There's a, a title slide from a movie. America's coldest, richest state is warming 10 times faster than the rest of the world. Well, from that could I conclude that the rest of the world's warming or cooling 10 times slower than Alaska. It, it doesn't sound as good though to say that. So, but this is an acknowledgement of regional changes being much bigger than global changes. So this is the global temperature network, the GHCN network, and it's an animation there. You, you go through it, and you can see a lot of the world remains white. You do get red spots popping up here and there where there's station, but there's a lot of places where there's not a continuous record throughout 100 years or you know some suitable length of time. And this map, I got it from Wikipedia, so caveat emptor, but it shows stations that were continuous since 1920, 
and I picked 1920 because you get that previous warm period in the 1920s and 30s. So it'd be nice to include that if you're going to do some trend analysis. And you can see huge parts of the globe are not sampled. So this is a sort of a global shot. This is based on more recent satellite data. And I, I almost pulled this randomly out of a paper by some folks at Colorado, showing the spatial distribution of five-year or what is this, six or seven year trend. And you can see warmings and coolings all over the place. The X's show the regional changes that simply would not be sampled. Oh my, okay. By, <laughs> you know, the, the current network. Ships don't add anything. So global coverage, poor coverage of the globe. These data holes are the devil's playground because that's where the analysts can insert data, create it, interpret it, and so on, and basically pull global warming out of some, you know, their ear or someplace. <laughs> okay, so uh, I then suggest, but I only have 30 seconds here, that you, it's better to look at regional changes that are predicted by the models, and here's Alaska, big warming, but it's not happening, it's all Pacific Oscillation, Colorado, that's my station. That's me in one of our little snowstorm, snowstorms. And this is what's happening up there. All right, had to decline. With a hockey, hockey stick, warming, then cooling. But instead of seven degrees Fahrenheit per century, it's warming at about one quarter of that rate over that 30 years. So skip on here. OK, got some Roy Spencer data. And there's 0.27 degrees of warming over the past 34 years globally. Half of that can be attributed to the absence of volcanoes. That leaves one-tenth of a degree of global warming since 1980. At that rate, another quarter, third of a degree by the time 2099 comes around. So art of deception is what you do to the data. Uh, if you torture data, it will confess. <laughs> Or Dilbert, a little more pithy. I didn't even know data could be real. And then their, their rewriting of history, I think I got it compared to the ultimate rewriter of history, was deleting the Dust Bowl is like Commissar Yeshot, being replaced by Mr. Allentop, <coughs> who was in Stalin's back today. So, okay, thank you. <laughs>